Welcome to E360 TV, the live streaming and on-demand destination for influential voices and enlightened audiences. We offer trending, grassroots, and purpose-driven content across a diverse range of interests. E360 TV is more than just watching programs. We offer the ability to interact with live shows connecting audiences to real, authentic influencers and storytellers while streaming to millions of devices. Real experiences. Raw conversation. One destination for it all. E360 TV. On July 4th, 1962, I found myself in the lost and found of mankind. Just because something finds its way to the lost and found doesn't mean that it wants to be there. Just because something finds its way to the lost and found doesn't mean that the person who lost it doesn't care for that lost item. You are writing moments that people will learn from, grow from, and heal through for thousands of years. Together we are co-authoring a unique moment in time. That DNA, those fingerprints, they're gonna be gone. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But it is your story that they will tell for thousands of years. But only if you leave it. Things that do not serve you must go. The longer you wait, the more time you give them to trick you into serving them. 22 homes in foster care, everything I wore as a scar, as a shame, things that started like Velcro on my spirit. After just a few months, then years, then decades, I had believed myself into believing that they were indelible tattoos. Sometimes we have to be broken down to appreciate the view once we start getting up. I want you to leave this place and know that you have been changed. Why? How do I know it's true? Because each of you has just changed. something hey jill backstage please drop your links into our private chat right here within Streamyard. i just got a text that you're sending them somewhere else they need them in here so they can trans you know do their magic so there we go um how are you guys doing 
You're looking awesome as always. Good morning to all of you all over the world. Welcome to today's installment of Bathroom Moments. You know who I am, but just in case you don't, uh, I'm Lauren, Lauren Michaels Harris, and I'm so excited to be here today fulfilling that wonderful promise that guarantees us all that when we come together with the same mindset, heart set, a place of agreement, if you will, a sacred space, magic, absolutely, spiritual magic happens. So today's no different. There's the bell of purpose. I'll ring it every time on purpose, with purpose, that some truth is out on the table. And speaking of tables, we have a whole buffet for you today. Mm -hmm. It's food oriented. You know, I hope you brought something or are within reach of something to eat. Mm -hmm. You know how we love to eat. I got a banana. Would you eat this banana? Just because I would. My husband's like, ew. It has, um, he calls them liver spots. I'm like, honey, that's called ripe. Okay. I eat it. Some people don't. They're very picky. Um, I don't care. As long as I get it in me, right? So how is everybody doing today? How's your week so far? Hallelujah. Hump day. We made it. Halfway through. Big plans for the weekend. We're excited. One of my coaching clients, Jeanette Ramos, the founder of It Takes a Village Housing out of Camden, New Jersey. Her and her significant other will be in Chicago. And we're all going to dinner uh, Saturday night. So that's exciting. Oh, black 60-year-old Macaulay Calkin, right here. Mm. Guess what happened yesterday? You know, Brian and I, my husband, are headed to Romania in the spring for International Children's Day. And we were brought aboard to do that through the International Children's Foundation out of Geneva, Switzerland. So yesterday, uh, I had a call from my good friend, Maureen Flatley, who is from Capitol Hill. And she's the woman you guys might remember way back at the beginning of this career for me about six, seven years ago. She recruited me off LinkedIn to go to Washington, D.C. and testify before Congress on the, the need for change uh, within the foster care system here in the United States. Primarily, I spoke on removing trash bags. Right. So anyway, she, she yesterday we were on a catch up call and I mentioned the Romania trip and she went berserk. I had no idea this woman's got 30 years of um, uh, digging her, her her claws into the orphanage problem. Uh, she's one of the biggest uh, pundits on Capitol Hill, responsible for 38 bills being passed in 36 years uh, through Congress, protecting our children here in the United States. Um, yeah, I remember when I first met her, she goes, you know, 40 some states have stiffer rules for protection of their fish than they do their children. Right? Who knew? So anyway, now it's already in the works. I got some stuff this morning. Guess what? They're sending us there as ambassadors for the United States. And so now it's possible that a PBS team will be following us to record everything for a documentary. And I get to bring a couple of my coaching clients to be a part of it all because there's a five-day tour around the country. We're going to visit orphanages, um, lock-up facilities for youth, uh, high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools. Um, there's a big uh, thing the first day where 87 schools will be in one arena. They anticipate around 8,000 children or students. Kids don't like being called children. Uh, but anyway, so exciting. God is good all the time and all the time. Got that right. Can I get an amen? So anyway, well, there it is. I guess I got one. So listen, thank you, Jill. We see that girls go ahead, grab that stuff. So anyway, very excited. Uh, I'll keep you apprised of it. I've already purchased my little book, you know, those travel books with all the pictures and stuff in it. I didn't know Romania was like a Spanish kind of country. Did you? I thought it was like Eastern Europe. It's because I ain't never been nowhere. But I'm about to. There we go. So why did I tell you to get some food? You might be hungry. Um, because today, you know, we get our, our, our bread here every day when we pour into each other. But today, we're talking about real food. Today, I'm really excited. Never thought about there being something like this out there. But it's out there. How do I know? Because the founder is here with us today. I'm speaking of Jill Hecker. She has a wonderful ebook. You, I'm sure you saw it. Every dish has a story, and it does. Food had to start somewhere. Somebody had to name it. 
who said put this much paprika and who said girl you better not right so i love here's why i love this so much you guys know 22 homes had an adoptive family and then when i was 32 i found my birth family both of those mothers have now gone on to glory and guess what so did all their recipes when they died those recipes pretty much unless they were in our heads died with them and i'm like who has you know my grandmother's biscuit recipe nobody who has my aunt candy's fried pie recipe nobody so this is one of the reasons i love joe hacker she's an author and a culinary get this storyteller now she's been passionately cooking and studying food history for over 40 years girl how could you be doing this for over 40 years what'd you do start 10 years before you were born nice try joe hacker anyway her profound interest peaked at a young age while reading current and vintage cookbooks the recipes she discovered uh led to a curiosity of the dishes say that dishes mm, dishes origin after years of exploring and learning she came to realize that her favorite food decades are dishes from the 30s through the 80s the 30s huh succotash suffering succotash i wonder where that came from she launched her jill launched her renowned youtube channel yester kitchen with over 14,000 subscribers and it's still growing her channel celebrates these and those historic classic dishes along with their stories this keeps them from getting lost in history jill's charismatic personality and passion for history shine through in every episode and she did not pay me to say that hey never mind don't get greedy, Lauren. So anyway, yeah, how cool is that? So first of all, before I get Jill in here, I thought, you want to see something uh, funny? Okay, so I'm going to get Jill in here. Um, when this, Jill, remember I told you I was going to do the countdown? I'm not. I'm going to bring you in during this video. So just be ready. Um, yeah, this is funny. Watch this. Watch this, you guys. <laughs> We're not going to watch the whole thing, but just to show you how far we've come, okay? Or not. Yes, sir, wedding bells finally rang in the life of Margie Blake. Back from their honeymoon, she and Tim are headed for a life of wedded bliss, they think. Wait a minute. Yes, the honeymoon is over Hold for Tim. Hold on. Now that he starts I'm back sitting to work. watching it, and you guys don't even see it yet. Hold on. See, you know what? That's why I cannot. Thank you, Jesus. I cannot wait until I have a deal with NBC or somebody because I'm telling you what, they need to get me out of this tech tech world. I'm not good at it at all. Clearly. What? I can own mine. I'm just saying. Watch this, though. Too funny. Okay. You know what? Yes, sir. Hold wedding on, bells on. finally rang in the life of Margie Blake. Let's bow our heads, please. I'm just. Okay, maybe it's not me at all. That is possible. There it is. I hit that. Breathe, Lauren. My ADHD. See, I learned how to do this through meditation. Hold on. Da da da. Da da da. Now come back. There. Okay, here it goes. For the fifth time today, take a look. Jesus. Housewife cooking school. <laughs> like men didn't cook. Yes, sir, wedding bells finally rang in the life of Margie Blake. Back from their honeymoon, she and Tim are headed for a life of wedded bliss. Hey, Tim. Tim strong, because Margie was not light. Yes, the honeymoon is over for Tim now that he starts back to work. Tim must work outside. And it's over for Margie, too, as she enters her bright new kitchen to cook her first Lord meal. Oh, have mercy. Can she prepare those favorite dishes of Tim's just like his mother used to make? 
And what let's would not forget like for her dinner, four inch pumps. Just loves chocolate cake. Go ahead, try one. All you have to do is follow the recipe. This is going to be easy. Let's see what's next. It says cream butter until soft and smooth. Mm. Cream the butter? Better get the cream. Lord. That's right. Pour it in. The recipe says cream the butter, so put in lots of cream. Girl. Just look at that silky smooth texture of that batter. I'm looking. Will Tim be surprised? Will Tim be surprised? No, Margie. Your cake didn't turn out so well because you misunderstood a term in your cookbook. You'll find that your cookbook contains many terms which pertain to cooking alone. It is necessary for you to know what these terms mean. For real? They were, they, were, they were through a university in 1949. Hi, Jill Hacker. Good How morning. are you? I'm fabulous. How are you? And I absolutely love that. I've seen it before. It's great. You have? Okay. Is it worth watching all the way through? It is if you're a nerd like me, yeah. <laughs> what? Tell us something. The world has really changed, of course. Thank goodness. What? What what goes through your mind when you watch that clip from 1949 and how dumb they made Margie seem? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, actually, it was just, this is where my nerdiness comes from. It was just, it's just 100% indicative of the time. So I look at it as a history lesson, you know, instead of, oh my God, I can't believe she's doing that. It's right. like, Truly, that's that, so. I mean, so my heart swells because you can see the evolution of from any little helpful video, you know. Yeah, yeah. And you can see the evolution in, of our history and learn, you know, where people come from. It's fascinating. exactly. And you're into the story part, uh, pretty much. If I'm not mistaken, the history of how the food found its way to us, how it was named, who did it, this, that, and the other, all those variables. But um, what about the part like Margie uh, obviously didn't have. Um, like a handwritten or those boxes with the recipe cards that you get, someone gives it to you when, well, you know, you inherit it, which in, in a lot of families, it's a coveted piece to get. They fight over those cookbooks, those handwritten recipes, those note cards, if you will. Okay. Now I know for a fact, like we have some upstairs from Brian's mom that she passed out. She had an entire Bible of all the meals that she made for them growing up. And I mean, she is so intricately detailed with you know now make sure you set this the frozen strawberries out for about 30 minutes you know and of course the packaging when she wrote it in the 70s or 80s or whenever it was is totally different now because now they come in a bag mainly yeah we're in those little member so anyway let's talk about how you got to this place um of embracing the stories that ride sidecar to some of our favorite foods and also, I'm going to dip out, let you say hello, bring it in, tell people where you are in the world, and we'll get started. Sure. Well, hey, everyone. I am Jill Hecker, and my absolute passion is cooking from the past, as Lauren was saying. I am here in beautiful northern Idaho, and it's 6 a.m. here, so that's why I was putting the links in the wrong place. So sorry about that, Lauren. Um, I'm still still charging my brain. Um, so... It's truly, I've truly been studying food history and cooking for over 40 years. Um, I'm older than that, a little older than that. Um, and it really kind of started from a crazy place. I, um, I, I didn't have a lot of friends in school. I was one of those kids that always got teased. And um, so I became very, very introverted and to myself. And so because of that, I started reading cookbooks. I don't know why I was drawn to cookbooks, but I was. So I started reading cookbooks and reading them cover to cover, like anyone would have a, read a book. Um, it's just kind of, you know, you know, everyone's been through school. Some people have had great experiences. Some people have bad experiences. Mine was a little on the bad experience. And so we all deal with it in our own ways. And that was mine. So um, this was maybe around 12 years old, 10, 12 years old. And I just started reading cookbooks. And from there, um, I, I was just reading so many recipes that I, I just kind of um, started wondering where they came from. It, it, it sounds so interesting. It really does. And we're going to watch one of your videos. I watched the Sloppy Joe one. 
Oh. I love, do you do all your own video editing and all that, Jill? I have an editor. I, I tried and I failed miserably. So um, Good, I, I'm not doing I, that. I, I have a, um, I've actually had three editors. The one, if you're going to show that one, it was a couple editors ago, but the one I oh, have now I is think, just amazing. Um, and I mean, your videos get crazy views, thousands and thousands. I'm looking at the sloppy Joe one has yeah. 45,000 views. Yeah. So tell me something where there are views. In many cases, there's uh, questions and comments and things from the, your, your viewers. What are they telling you, Jill? Why do they love this show so much? Because I am sparking their childhood memories, their food memories. And it's, I've gotten so many comments saying my mom made this or my grandmother made this. And thank you so much for bringing it back. And I haven't thought about it since I was a kid. And now people are just and, and now right now there's just such a huge craving for nostalgia. And so everyone just, you know, going back to that time in childhood, you know, where they were sitting at the dinner table and, you know, or taking their lunch to school. Right in the world. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And well, um, well, first of all, let me throw this in. Back to the dinner table, which in a lot of homes doesn't even exist anymore. No. They have it, but people eat wherever they want to, whenever they want to, in their rooms, yeah. at, the, at the island, in the family room, or out at McDonald's, right? Yeah. Yep. So let me ask you, before you started all this, when you before you even sat down and had this brainchild, what was your fondest recollection or recipe from your own childhood? Actually, one of them I actually did a video on, but we just when when my mother would cook from the cookbooks that we had, that so then I can see it in book form, in print, and then actually see it on the dinner table. I was one of those kids that like, wow, you know, you took this and got to here. Um, there was a dish she made often with, um, it was a chicken dish with a sherry cr sour cream mushroom sauce that um, to this day, you can't go wrong. And to this day, when I make it, I'm right back to being 12 again, you really? know, and, and yeah. And um, oh, is that one that you'll pass down through your own family? Oh yeah, I've got the cookbook and um yeah, definitely. Definitely oh, my my whole channel is a legacy to my kids. Really? I mean, it's just oh, like that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, my favorite meal growing up, believe it or not, I don't care what the combination of components were, but whenever my mom said, Guess what? We're having breakfast for dinner tonight. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> I would just start running around screaming like it was Christmas. That yeah. To this that was day, a favorite. <laughs> Too. Really? Breakfast for dinner? It's, it's fun. It's like you're not supposed to have breakfast for dinner, you know? Mom's so, breaking the rules. Yes. That kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So um, are you a good cook? Does it take a good cook to, to really dig into this sort of thing? No. Everything I make on my channel, the recipes I pick, I make sure are easy. And I make sure that most of the ingredients are accessible nationwide. So everyone can do anything on my channel. It's very easy. They're very easy. I don't do complex things whatsoever. I'm lazy. I'm a lazy cook. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I just like it to taste right and be right. And, and I love the memories. Food, for me, is an experience. I'm not yes. a foodie. I'm not a foodie. It's mm -hmm. not like, because that's almost like, in my opinion, a foodie is almost like a, um, you know, Siskel and Ebert. Oh, you know, wow. Yeah. yeah going to places and because we have a friend who goes and she's either taking a bunch of pictures or giving the people a really hard time. So sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's not, but I enjoy the experience, the shopping, the, the setting it up the night before and oh, yeah. prepping and all of that. Um, talk about this. Um, the stories that you have, where do you go to find all of the truth? Because I noticed in the Sloppy Joe one, there were some urban myths in there that people thought, you know, it started in, I think, Puerto Rico or someplace. And nope, there was Sloppy Joe's bar in some other place. Nope. Talk about how do you get to the, the real root or the real core or the beginning, the origin story of our favorite foods? Well, what I love to talk about is sometimes you just don't know because the people who could tell you have passed on. 
So the, a lot of times the best I can do, and I kind of love this part, is give people like I did in Sloppy Joe and I do in several other of my videos, like it could like the Reuben sandwich. That's another one. It could be this, could be this, could be this. And then I leave it up to everyone to just hear everything and decide for themselves or go, I don't care where it came from. It's just good, you know, but okay. I always make the original recipe so they can always go back in time and make, you know, make it as it was. And I don't do anything updated or low fat or keto or any of that stuff. I, I cook from the original recipe. So, so it's, and I, I know I'm circling around now. No, no, so, no. The, um, <laughs> so, um, so back to the history. So sometimes there's a very definitive, yes, this is the story. And sometimes there's not. And that's just one of the beauties of food history. I think yeah. time for you guys to get involved, drop in the comments, your favorite memory from childhood dinners or lunches or breakfast. Um, and, oh, I just had a horrible trigger. I thought about my sister, Sharon, who thought she could cook and she was always in charge of our lunches during the summer. <laughs> peanut butter and jelly sandwiches she messed up. She would put like a pound of uh, jelly, a big old, she wouldn't even spread it. It'd be one big old lump in the middle, you know, right? Mm -mm -mm. And those of you from the hood, remember those meatloaf sandwiches? I, I just had a meatloaf sandwich the other night. Yeah. That, I might have one today. But here's where I want to go. So when let's talk about your, your viewers. Do they ever get pissed off and say, like, girl, you got that wrong? I know for a fact, because my granny told me this came from there. Do you ever, do they ever help you get it right? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's um I mean, it's YouTube, right? So everyone's on there. Um, so sometimes, sometimes I'm on, like I said, I'm always wanting to learn. I learn every day and I love learning new things. And so if somebody has something outside of my research that they share with me, I love it. I absolutely love it because it just, it just enhances your knowledge more. True. Now, Jill, how long I'm looking at the age of the videos, I see one that goes back as far as four years ago. How old, what's... When did you start the show? When did you kick this off? I started in 2019. Oh. And I started out of um, a need because my last son left the house and I didn't know what to do. And I've always had this thought of a channel in mind, but it's always been like, I can never do this. I, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I look stupid. No one's going to watch, you know, insert your problem here. But then once he left, I finally, someone, someone told me, just start. Because, you know, so I did. And so that's how Yester Kitchen was born. Wow. Yester Kitchen. Uh, how did, how, tell us about the experience when you started. Did it just pop off from the very beginning? You were a hit or did you have to build it? Did it have to gain some traction? What was that like for you? It was tough. I wanted to quit so many times because it wasn't, it didn't take off at the beginning. It was like, you know, inching and inching and inching. And so finally, I'm like, this isn't working. I'm going to stop. And peep, and I had a habit in my life of stop starting things and stopping them because they didn't work fast enough. So I thought this one, I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to keep going. So now I'm three years into it, three plus years into it. And um, I've got over 15,000 subscribers and they're all wonderful i'm i have the most amazing audience they're just so involved they're so kind they're so they send me gifts they um i i get mm -hmm. people they do people send me vintage cookbooks people send me family recipes um one of my viewers yeah. crocheted a trivet cro crocheted trivets for me because i was using the ceramic ones and um she said those aren't 70s you need crocheted trivets and made me crochet trivets wow they're wonderful people wonderful people just just like to talk about food and childhood memories. And it's right. just makes me so happy. One. I just found one. Yeah. And, and, and you know, cause what I was doing, I know everybody's like, where is he? He doesn't seem present. Cause I was actually on YouTube looking at the homepage. And I was like, Ooh, I should pull that one out. Ooh, no, look at that one. Ooh. And it was just one thing triggering me after the next. And then I saw her. And then I saw her face. Dun, 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 dun. Um, I'm not kidding you. I saw this and it was hands down. Got to see it. This was one of my, this was one of the only times I really loved my sister, Cheryl, the one above me that used to beat me up all the time because she was the one who would make these. 
popcorn balls. Oh, oh my God. God. I haven't had a popcorn ball in probably 40 years. <laughs> They're good. They're I'm good. I'm not kidding. Because remember, you know what it makes me think about? It makes me think about Saturday nights, watching Creature Feature at oh. Growing Up. And it makes me remember about those bake sales at school. Mm -hmm. no? oh, oh, yeah. You know what sure. I mean? Right. So, you guys, let's take a look. Let's take a look at the uh, popcorn ball video. Take a, a peek inside. Back to the 1950s to start celebrating Halloween and the beloved popcorn Coming out. ball. You're going to love it. Let's get started. I'm actually in a costume on this one. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> I don't remember which one. Here we go. Hey, everyone. I'm Jill, and this is Yester Kitchen. Welcome oh. to Halloween. So today, I'm dressed as a Yester Kitchen fan. I was going to say. Check out next girl. week. I've got something better. In the meantime, if you want to be Yester Kitchen fan, the link's in the description below. Okay. Today, Halloween, 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 Halloween. We have so many things to make, and you're going to love it. So popcorn balls, huge handout in the 1950s. And actually, popcorn itself was a big snack in the 1950s because it was accompanying this brand new invention called television. Oh, popcorn and TV went amazingly together. Anyway, I'm going to start this whole thing, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about popcorn. So the first thing I have is a medium-sized pan. And yes, I have my candy thermometer on it. And as you can see, it's not all the way at the bottom. You really don't want that because- Who has a candy the thermometer hand? The um, heat and not <laughs> the <actual> cheap content. <laughs> so- I don't even know how to use one, but I've got to learn. I've got some butter. I've got a paper towel. Mm, you want your butter very, 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 very soft. And we're just gonna butter the sides. It adds flavor and it's also gonna help prevent sticking. So you just want, really, you want to really, really Butter your pot well off and remove that. Is that some special and kind don't of a pot? Don't get your butter just yet because you're going no, to No, they're butter very, very cool. It's, it's almost like a caffeine. Okay. So now we'll put this in and we'll get going. All right, now that your sides are all buttered, we're just going to make the candy. My favorite part. So in here goes two cups of sugar. My sides are buttered. And then we're going to add a cup and a half of water. Half a teaspoon of salt, teaspoon of white vinegar, vinegar, and you're going to want a half a cup a of light corn syrup. I did not know. I that. always show you this trick because you know there's new people all the time and welcome new people. So super easy trick to use corn syrup and get it out of here. Cooking spray. Oh, that's a good tip. I'm just going to spray it and pour a half a cup. Is that that K row syrup? Oh, yeah. Out it yeah. goes. Is that just the best trick ever? Okay. So now, see? Look at that. Nice and wow. Cool. All right. So now we're just going to start cooking this. This needs to go all the way up to 250 degrees, which is why I have my candy thermometer. But if you don't have a candy thermometer, never fear. I will show you. It needs to go to... Candy, cooking candy goes into different stages, and that's when the sugar loses moisture and gets harder and harder. We're going to go to the hardball stage, which is 250 degrees, and I'll show you how to do that. So we're going to let this just get started, and I'm going to check back in with you when it's going. Popcorn got really popular here in America at around 1890, and people just took to it. I mean, come on. It was delicious. It was easy. It was fun to watch pop. It was an amazing snack. But that kind of stopped when the depression started in 1929 because it became expensive. So popcorn then became a luxury. But after the depression, popcorn was back. Everyone loved it. Now, during World War II and food ration, most of the sugar went to support our troops. So there wow. really wasn't any candy and popcorn, but people loved popcorn. Now, after the war, sugar was back. Popcorn balls came so into fashion. As a matter of fact, People made popcorn balls to hand out as Halloween treats. That was back in the days where homemade treats were safe to eat. Okay. It's kind of sad that it's not anymore. So in the meantime, while this is going, I have five quarts of popcorn. I want to see it. Wait. A little bit more. We're going to bring in. Oh, wait. Good. I got to see how you pour it first. With wax paper. Wax paper. I remember that. Popcorn <laughs> and candy will not skip. Right. Wax paper. 
Now we're going to take this. I bet a lot of people don't even have wax paper at home anymore. All over your no, it's not very common anymore, Grab but some. they sell it. You really want to squeeze it down, which is why you want your hands to be able to touch it. And there you go. Popcorn ball. Oh my God. I want this, one. Because the top layer is going to be cooled by okay. the air and just keep wrapping. Oh my God. I, They're so good. They are so good. They're so good. Hey, I've always wondered this about just popcorn. And I hope you can answer it because I bet if you were on Jeopardy and they had a food origin category, you'd clear it. So, <laughs> ooh, if you ever are on Jeopardy and they have that, you go to Double Jeopardy. You should pay, you should put all your money on it. <laughs> Will do. Just saying. So, <laughs> no. Yes. Did popcorn, do you know how popcorn actually got discovered? I heard that some Indian person, oops, Native American, <laughs> threw uh, uh, an ear of corn in the fire and it got over to the side a little and just started popping. And all of them from around the fireplace or the fire, wherever they were, started running. You know what? I love your story. Um, I know it came from the Native Americans from way back when, but I didn't know the specifics because I don't know everything. And I love that. That's <laughs> what I heard that it just, you know. Um, so, I mean, I find that so interesting because you look at stuff and you go, how did someone know that this would do that? Yep. Yep. I mean, it's a lot of times it's by accident. Happy accidents. Talk about that. How many accidents? Tell us. Okay. Amaze us with your plethora of food knowledge on some of the most outrageous origins that we would never have even considered. Okay, so one of my favorites is comes out of necessity. Well, not necessity, actually came out of lack of food waste. So you know what rum balls are? You know those little tiny cake balls and they have rum in them and they're rolled in sprinkles or nuts? I know okay, every you know. dessert, clearly. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Well, Rum balls actually came out of a need for bakers to deal with food waste because they would, um, they were in, um, was it Vienna? And they were, you know, the, the bakers would make their cakes and of course they would carve their cakes because they wanted different shapes. Oh. And in a very classic um, chef thing to do is not waste food. It's just, you just don't want to waste food. Sure and no. so they had all these cake cuttings and they didn't know what to do with them and they figured we got to do something with them basically scraps scraps total scraps okay and that's when they decided to just crumb them up and mix them with rum and throw some know, rum, in, rum in nobody because, else care what the hell's in there right just throw some alcohol on it it'll be fine and that's where rum balls came from from out of a need of trying to combat food waste okay give us another one. Oh man now I've got like a million, million things in my head. Well, as far as like, okay, so my favorite story ever is, um, but, it, but it is Thousand Island Dressing. And it was actually my very first video. I look like a deer in the headlights. I, I didn't know what I was deer. doing. I to pull that one up. Oh man, it's it's kind of embarrassing, but it's my favorite story. So, um, so this was like back in 1907. And there was a, uh, that was back in the silent movies were popular as before regular movies. And there was an actress. <laughs> See, I have a very- I may do that. Eye. They're so smart. They are, they are. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. You have a great Thank audience. You. Go ahead with your story, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 we're good. I love this stuff. So, um, so her name was May Irwin. She was a silent screen actress. And actually, if you think of whoever the biggest actress is today, that's how popular she was. She was everything. And the reason for that is because she was credited with the very first on-screen kiss. And it was really just a on the cheek, but everyone's like, oh my God, you know? It was, it was just, yeah, crazy. Did you see what that floozy did? Right, right. right? So and I mean, she had half an ankle showing. <laughs> you don't want that. I mean, that's, so this, this is like, so she, she's already etched her name in history because she had this claim to fame. Okay. What does that have to do with Thousand Island Dressing? So her and her husband went up to a place called Clinton, New York, and on a little vacation, and he was a fisherman. And so there was a little bed and breakfast up there, and the wife ran the bed and breakfast, and the husband did the fishing tours. Okay. And so they would be out on doing the fishing tours all day. And then they would come back at night and the wife whose name was Sophia 
made dinner and she served them salad and May was eating the salad and she's like, what is this dressing? Because she's never tried it in her life. Right. It's just Thousand Island dressing. But it was just her made up dressing that she just served at the bed and breakfast and that was it. And so she says, it's just my dressing. So she asked for the recipe. I'm giving you a very condensed version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she asked for the recipe and um, brought it back home to New York with her. And she had one of her best friends owned the Waldorf Astoria. Yeah. And so she brought it to him because, you know, she was all high society. Right. So she brought it to him and she said, you've got to try this stuff. And he did. And he thought it was great. And he told his mater D to put it on the menu. And I mean, and it's just like all, I mean, just to think, I mean, how innocuous is Thousand Island dressing now? You know, we don't even think about it, but this no. is what it, a big it's, deal is. It's the only dressing outside of oil and vinegar that I know how to make from scratch. Oh, well then honey, on my video is the original that she wrote down on the postcard. Really? It's very similar. Very good. It tastes like, okay, how about this? How different is when you make May's version to what comes out of the store bought? <laughs> The flavor profile is the same, but you know, there's no chemicals or preservatives. That's and um, what I was wondering about. every time I, I only make my own dressings. I never buy store-bought because it's just, they're easy. They're fun. I've got about maybe five or six or seven dressings like green goddess. Where did that come from? You know, or sometimes people would share with me their local famous, you know, their local popular dressings. You know and, what? I've never considered trying to create my own dressing. Oh. Right. So talk about this. I, I don't know if this is up your up your alley, mm -hmm. but is there a process, a base that you start with if you're going to make a dressing? Like a lot of people think it would be like, if it's creamy, it's going to be mayo, I would think. Um, or if it's one of the others, oil and fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you do it? My classic that I make all the time is from my grandmother. So Ooh. there you go. What's it and called? it's, it's, I don't even have it. I don't even have a name. My, my, um, one of my sons used to call it mommy sauce. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, is it but a cream? It's, it's a literally oil, vinegar, garlic, salt, pepper, and Dijon. That's it. And, Dijon. and it's amazing. It's, really? And then from there, you can add in herbs, you can add in different vinegar. I mean, you can customize. Dressings are so customizable. And, and as far as the creamy ones you're talking about, almost always mayonnaise based. Once in a while, sour cream. Okay, so what about this? So, and be truthful. Okay. And, you know, tell the truth and spite the devil, like my grandma would say. <laughs> when you're choosing a recipe to feature, what if it's something you don't like? Because when you make it at home, I'm sure, I don't think you throw it away. When you're done, you guys eat it. But do you, what's that challenge like? Creating uh, a video and, and providing that story for a, a particular dish that you might not care for? Well, I usually make dishes I like <laughs> okay. because, um, but the, I, I mean, I have thousands of recipes. I have hundreds of cookbooks and all, all of them from all vintage, all from the past. And um, so I really don't have that problem because like, I've always, like, like I wanted to do a dish with liver because in the seventies appetizers with liver in sixties was, was very popular. And so I put a post up on my community page, you know, in, on YouTube. And I said, if I made a liver dish, would you guys eat it? And I got about a 50-50. So I decided not to do it because if they're not going to watch it, what's the point of doing what's it? What's the point of doing it? Yeah. I get it. I get it. So what about when you find an original recipe that might have something that is controversial today? Uh, because, you know, we know a lot more or think we do about what's good for us and what isn't or anything like that. Any challenges on that side of the table? Not really. The only thing is that um, like 50s, 60s, 70s, especially the 50s when it all started, um, huge um, convenience foods, right? Everything out of a can, everything out of a box. That was just actually I talk about that in my tuna noodle casserole video about why it got so popular. Um but um i love to noodle i do too it's so good uh -huh. <laughs> so customizable um, yeah with peas in it always oh yeah and and so i you know so people are like you know are you always going to do convenience food i'm like well that was indicative of the decade so yes <laughs> speaking of it's convenience i'm sorry but i got it before this 60 year old mind forgets you go 
Do what do you know about the origin of TV dinners? Yes, once we have a restaurant here that sells them, and every time we eat dinner there, we buy like five of them and put them just because even though it doesn't look like the ones, you know, it kind of does, but doesn't. What, talk about that. How did that? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I mean that was that was um, it was Swanson that created it. Um, so I can't remember his name right now. It's okay. off my tongue. But they were literally created. They were called TV dinners because, first of all, you could eat them in front of the TV, which was in the fifties, which was brand new, super exciting, and they actually kind of almost resembled a TV, you know, with their their squares and their different. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. And th th they just took off immediately because it was something that was frozen. You could stick it in the oven, right? You couldn't do a microwave back then, but you could stick it in the oven right. and dinner was served. And that, that was just one of, that was one of the top inventions in the in modern times that just took off, just completely and took off. One of the things I love about the decades and how you take us back is because it reconnects with the joy of cooking. Mm -hmm. You know whose uh, cookbook? Oh, yeah, um, yeah. One of the most famous cookbooks ever. Uh, so, do you feel, Jill? Because we're going to get it. Let's talk about your book. Uh, do you feel that uh, just even your cookbook alone will help some of us reignite with the things that go with the foods that we love? Because it wasn't just the taste or the the aroma or you know, how it got better the next day or whatever the case may be, but the stories of not just the food, but the people who cooked yes. it and created yeah. it. Talk about that. Why do you feel that's so important in this day and time? Because, especially now, because looking back on a happier time and a time where you were taken care of or a time, you know, where dinner would just show up on the table or a time like you, like you brought it before, nobody really eats dinner together anymore at the time that family did come and sit down at the table. And those are all just memories that um, that just live with you forever. And as a matter of fact, um, I'd have one chapter about this in my book. I wasn't planning on doing it, but mm -hmm. my publisher said add one. So you'd add it about how the brain takes what you've eaten from as a child and processes it into a good experience or a bad experience and how that follows you. Your brain never forgets, never forgets. And that completely has everything to do with why you like and don't like things as an adult now. And it's just fascinating the process that's happening. And so all those memories are there. All the food is there. All the first time you tasted whatever is there. And it's just, um, like it, it explains so much about if you look back now, you know, explains so much about why you like the things you do, why you don't like the things you don't like, you know, like you could have been having spaghetti and meatballs with your family at dinner the night you found out your parents were getting divorced. So chances are high that as an adult, you just don't want spaghetti and meatballs because it's just associated with such a bad memory or yeah. oh. on the opposite, a good memory. A right? good memory. Yeah. Oh. Jill, in your book, what I found very interesting when I took a look at the ebook was that you know, there's, I think there's like 25 chapters, 23 of them are stories, one including Yester Kitchens, but stories of a just a plethora of people. How did you go about finding, uh, you know, Ian's story, Eric's story? And I'm really interested in what Tawana's story is because I don't know, I could be wrong. I think she's African American. <laughs> yeah, she's Tawana. oh, what well, she's Tawana. That's why such such a good friend of mine. Um, About so that. here's my book, which is just amazing to hold it in your hands for the very first time. That was like one of my biggest things. Um, so actually, really quick, my book was born out of inspire inspirations for my audience, and it was because, like I said, they would always say my mom made this or my dad and. In the comments, they would just write their whole story about whatever dish I was making, about their memories of it. And that's when I started getting the idea of writing the book. So in a nutshell, the book is um, a collection of short stories from people from all walks of life that talk about their childhood food memories, like what you're talking about yours, you know, and, yes. and why it's so special. And at the end of every chapter is their recipe. So what I did was these are people I know, um, either they're personal friends of mine, a few are um, some of my fans from my channel that were 
that reached out. Okay. Um, um, a, a summer, other YouTube cooking creators, because I've gotten having a YouTube channel in the cooking world, you start to like get your little community of other creators and you become friends. And so anyway, I reached out to a bunch of people and I said, hey, I'm writing this book. I don't know what I'm doing, but if you're interested, I would love to um, interview you. And that's how I, so 23 of them said, okay, I'll do it. Wow. And um, and actually, I don't know if um, anyone out there knows um, Max Miller from Tasting History. He's got like over a million followers. He's a sweetheart. Wow. He actually does food history way further back than me. He does it in the Middle Ages. Um, oh, goodness. His story's in my book. So, you it's know. Weird yak, Pa. <laughs> you yeah. know, I've seen him make some crazy stuff. So <laughs> Somebody, Inside your book, here's a part uh, that you guys will be interested in. I want you to understand because I want you to go out and get the book just to have it. What a great gift to give those people, you know, in your family, even to reignite that experience of uh, generational stories and passing them and how important they are. I just love this idea. But inside, right at the beginning in the chapter, um, you really are what you eat or ate at least your mind thinks so jill says this the foods we eat as children have a profound effect on us as adults the brain is a miraculous thing and going into the writing of this book i had a theory that what our food experiences were as a child good or bad directly reflects who you are as an adult and as it turns out my theory was true now you have a friend uh i believe Dr. Kim Perkins, and you interviewed her on this subject. What she have to say about that? And I just want to say, I know it's true because I remember as a kid, I heard some other kid tell his mom, I don't like white rice when I was over there for dinner and he didn't have to eat it. And so from then on at home, I said, I don't like white rice. And for 25, 30 years, I thought I didn't like white rice. Isn't it crazy? That's what your brain does. It's, it's absolutely, absolutely amazing. Talk about that part about yeah. how, yeah, I think that's so fascinating. So it was funny because I never intended on including science whatsoever in the book. It was just supposed to be stories. And my publisher is the one that said, you know, you should include a, a chapter about science. And I'm like, well, I don't know anything about the science of it. But luckily I have a good friend, Kim, Dr. Kim Perkins, who is um, a PhD in positive psychology. And so she was the perfect person to talk to. So we did a Zoom for many, many, many hours. And she just explained literally how the brain works and how there is a little, little part of our brain called the hippocampus. And it goes to another little part of the brain called the amygdala. And that's where all our memories are stored. Like anything, and not necessarily food, but anything good or bad, you're, you're being, it's just anything you eat. I only talk about the food. I'm not talking about experiences. Yeah. Um, anything you eat is just made a snap decision is made in your brain immediately, whether you like it or not, it's totally involuntary. You have, you, you don't really have a say in it. It's just, Oh, I like it. Oh, I don't. And it just has so much to do with, you know, your makeup and who you are and your environment and everything like that. And that literally that snap decision carries you through life and mm. all the experiences you had growing up as a child, food related affect these decisions as you know going through life you know now that we think about it it makes perfect sense who hasn't um met a person who was food poisoned by something and now they don't touch that stuff or they choked on a chicken bone now they won't eat chicken right? ever again. yeah that is a real thing in there yes um, oh very much or like if you were in a family and your dinners were not very healthy, you know, like a, a, she gave me an example of like in, in the Midwest, you know, which by the way, the Midwest food is amazing, but it's like very filling, very calorie laden, very, you know, comfort food. But if it's like, if it's not a good experience for you, then later in life, you could become a vegetarian, you know, right. because that just, because you're, you know, your brain didn't process it in a positive way. You know what, what you just said is a great way to go into what I, I have as my last question to you. Um, this hour has flown by. Yeah. Um, you you mentioned at the forefront of the interview how you created this channel on YouTube and whatnot as a legacy for your kids. So let's fast forward 50 years from now, 60 years from now, and say one of your kids picked it up and was still doing it. What do you think the 2000s will say? Because I'm like, 
Do we have anything? Because, you know, it's not like it was back then. Are we creating food things now uh, outside? I don't like when my nieces and nephews come to visit, I can't stand it because you never know. One one month they're here because they go to school like in Chicago and come here sometimes on weekends. I'm vegan. The next month, I'm not eating anything with eyes that has an eye, that has eyes. Crazy shit, right? So I'm just saying, based on that kind of stuff, what do you think the cookbook 50 years from now that speaks to the stories will say about this day and age? Any ideas? Wow. There'd probably be a lot of keto. Yes. (laughs) I know. A lot of low fat. Well, I won't be around. (laughs) Right? It's not it's not fun food. It's not good food. It doesn't bring back any That's well who what knows? I mean. Yeah. How, how much I guess, that? you know, now put the and I remember when my mom used to cut that kale. Oh, the memories of when she would put that I mean, I have nothing against healthy food, but that thing that makes it that dish that everyone can't wait for on Thanksgiving or the memories. That's what I love about what you do. It's not just the decade and the time frame, but it's the memory and the time frame of what it means to when we enjoyed it the most. Exactly. Right? And you remind it's, me. It takes you back. And like I said, you know, these days where everything is so, you know, going back and feeling that nostalgia and feeling mm-hmm. that food. And it's like a big hug, you know, the comfort food is like a big hug. And it, oh, for sure. It doesn't have to be mayonnaise laden or cream of mushroom soup laden, which is happens to be one of my favorite ingredients. Um, it, it it just has to be whatever you experienced in your happiness that you takes go. you. Back. You guys, I'm gonna drop the link which is scrolling along the bottom. That'll take you directly to Amazon, as you can see. Uh, for every dish has a story, and I want to just say hats off to you, literally, hats <laughs> off to you. I see that you are. Um, signed up with Amazon Smile, which means that a portion of every one of your book sales uh, will go towards your choice of a nonprofit that you are behind. Do you want to mention who that is real quick for everybody? It's actually, um, uh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but they um, offer, they they help injured military vets with animals. So, so like they can service, support. service animals. Yes. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. So, oh. There's yet another reason to get over and pick up the book. And Jill, um, are you going to do another one? Is it going to be a follow-up? What's next for you? <laughs> if my husband has anything to say about it, that will not. But um, I'm actually, because <laughs> I literally took me a year and a half to write the oh, book. Right, exactly. And it was a are solid year back? and a half. It, right. it was it was like, where is my wife? No, there, I, I definitely left this open to have many more volumes because there's so many stories to tell. So. We'll see. Maybe, hopefully. Um, I'm also thinking about maybe um, doing a TV show where I'm interviewing people about the one dish that brings them back to their childhood while we make the dish. That's something that's in the works. Shh, don't tell anyone. Wait, you know where you're going to have this show? Nope, I'm still actually just conceptualizing it. Well, I'm just going to tell you this. Yes. Shameless plug in three, two, one. I'm an executive producer for the E360 Network. We have 118 shows. And they just two days ago gave me my own network on the network. And I can bring the best of the best. Congratulations. Thank you. So we need to. Right. I love it. Because what we, you know, my good friend, Teresa Griffin, who, um, and when you go on her show, uh, Tea Time with Teresa, you guys know she's on the E360 now. But I found her um, on YouTube. Uh, just like you. And when she goes live, there's uh, seven, eight hundred people live because she's a singer. She's Diana Ross's background singer, Patty LaBelle. But she sings while she's in there cooking. Right. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So she's over. But she does something totally different than you. And I think you'd be. A, well, we'll talk about it. Let's do it. What um, when can when and where we know it's YouTube, but your your show. How often is it uploaded or how do people, find? you know, when do they find the new one? What's the name of the channel? Okay. Go on YouTube, search Yester Kitchen as you can, all one word, as you can see down there, Yester Kitchen. And um, I release new videos every Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. And I've got about 250 videos. So if you're looking for retro and nostalgia, I've got, I will keep you busy for days. 
and you, guys, you guys, they got to be great. Thousands and thousands of people uh, could not be wrong. Well, they could, but in this case, they're not. So, <laughs> Bill, um, so excited that you were here. Uh, first time I ever had, I had a cookbook person before, but it was nothing like this. And I just love what you do. You're welcome back here anytime. Thank and thank you so much for you, reminding, of, uh, reminding all of us to never let go of those things, those memories that make us feel like we were there just moments ago. So thank you so much for that. And I want to say something to all of you. Thank you so much for being here today. I couldn't do it without you, nor would I want to, but let's do it again tomorrow, shall we? We will be here tomorrow with Gabriel Ortiz, an actor from Los Angeles that I've just recently started working with. I tell you what, I believe this kid is going to be the next Johnny Depp. You can decide yourself tomorrow after you meet him right here. Um, I'll meet you out front at 8 a.m. Central as we approach another illuminated conversation. Where? Right here on Bathroom Moments. Have a great day. Be the blessing that you want to receive. Jill, ah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you Have a great so much. It was so much fun. Anytime. Bye, you guys. Get the book. Get the book. Mm -hmm.